In this series of videos, we'll learn about the two independent sample t-test. We previously saw that we can use a one sample test for situations where we want to determine whether some population has a mean that's different from a specific known value. For example, let's say that I know the state average for SAT scores is 1050, but I want to know whether high school students who work part-time have lower SAT scores on average. In that case, if I sample a group of students who work, I know exactly what value I want to compare their SAT score to. It's 1050. But let's say that instead I want to determine whether students who work part-time study less hours each week than students who don't work. And let's assume that there is no statewide data on the average number of hours students spend studying each week. Now, I can sample the students who work and I can assess how many hours each week they spend studying. But what value do I compare this to? I mean, I don't know. This is where the two independent sample t-test comes in. I need to collect a second sample of students who don't work and use the average for that sample as an estimate emphasis on estimate of what the average number of study hours is in that population of students who don't work. So to be clear, there is one population of students who work and I sample from that population to estimate the average number of hours students in that population study and then I have a second population of students who don't work and I sample from that population to see the average number of our students in that population study. I'm then going to compare the means in these two samples in order to infer differences about their two population differences. That's the big picture. Okay, now let's get into the details. So the purpose of a two independent sample t-test is to compare the means of two populations where we don't know the population mean for either of them. This is possibly the most widely used statistical test there is. Notice again that we're talking about two populations. Yeah, we're comparing two sample means, but we're really interested in inferring whether there's a difference between the two populations. Now, these populations can be something fairly concrete, like we saw in this example. Uh, population one is all the high school students who work part-time, and population two is all of the high school students who don't work. But the two populations are often a little more abstract. For example, population one could be all the third grade students who may use a new reading curriculum. And population two could be all the third grade students who may just continue to receive their standard curriculum. As always, there are a number of assumptions that need to be satisfied. First, the outcome needs to be normally distributed in the populations. Again, if the sample size is large, say over 30, this becomes less of an issue. And the t-test is fairly robust to some non-normality. The outcome also has to be on an interval or ratio scale, but there are other tests available if it's not. Obviously, the test requires two independent samples, one from each population. By this, we mean that a score in one sample is unrelated to any of the scores in the other sample. 
probably the best example of violating the independent samples assumption is where you're looking at differences between a pretest and a post-test. In that case, each person's pretest score matches up with their post-test score because it's the same person. Scores in one group, those pretests, are linked to the scores in the other group, the post-tests. In that case, there's a much better alternative test that you should use, which we discuss in a different video. This version of the independent samples t-test also assumes that the variance in the two populations being sampled is the same. If the variances for the two samples are not equal, meaning that they're sufficiently different that we conclude that they're not the same value in the two populations, it can lead to problems with our type 1 error rate. Now, in that case, you can still do a t-test, but you need to make some adjustments for unequal variances. Now, we don't go into that process in this series, but I do discuss it in a separate video. For now, let's assume that the variances are in fact equal. Finally, because we're estimating population parameters based on our sample, it's important that the sample actually reflect the population so that these estimates are accurate. Hence, having data from a random sample drawn from each population helps to ensure that this is the case. If the data satisfy these assumptions, you can then work on formulating your hypotheses. Now, just like with the one sample t-test, hypotheses in a two independent sample t-test can be directional and one-tailed or non-directional and two-tailed. Now, if this is a little unclear, be certain to watch the video on framing hypotheses. First, let's look at how directional or one-tailed hypotheses slightly change when we have two independent samples rather than just one sample. One option is for our alternative hypothesis to be that mu1, the mean for population number 1, is less than mu2, the mean for population 2. But remember, in this case, we don't have a known quantity or value to compare our group to. We don't know what value to expect if there's no effect or no difference. <laughs> That's why we're sampling two groups. We don't have a mu0 anymore. So instead, it's mu1 is less than mu2. The mean for one population is less than the mean for another population. If the alternative hypothesis is mu1 is less than mu2, the null hypothesis must be that mu1 is equal to or greater than mu2. The other possibility for a directional alternative hypothesis is that mu1 is greater than mu2, in which case the null hypothesis is mu1 is less than or equal to mu2. Using a non-directional hypothesis, our alternative hypothesis would be mu1 is not equal to mu2, and our null hypothesis is mu1 is equal to mu2. Now, of course, you can also express your hypotheses using slightly geeky, everyday sort of language. Let's go back to our example at the start of this video, in which we wanted to examine hours spent studying, and where population one was high school students who work part-time, and population two was high school students who didn't work. Rather than state my alternative hypothesis as mu1 is less than mu2, I could say the mean hour studying for the population of students who work part-time is less than the mean hour studying for the population of students who don't work. 
Remember to keep in that slightly cumbersome but very important language of the population of students who... It's the population of students we want to estimate. We're not just looking at two sample averages. The whole point is to use inferential statistics to infer what we think those averages for the entire population look like. Okay? Now, if we had a two-tailed hypothesis, a similar wordy way of stating the alternative hypothesis would be something like the mean hours of studying for the population of students who work part-time is different than the mean number of hours spent studying for the students who don't work. And the null hypothesis would be some version of the mean number of hours studying for the population of students who work part-time is the same as the mean number of hours spent studying for the population of students who don't work. Okay? Bye for now.